In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning these things, so that we might grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. My dog died. But uh, that's not why I was out for a week. They put old Rush to sleep. A while back, but I was out for a week because of uh, some personal problems on the uh, her side of the family, and so we uh, dealt with that, etc. But I was in uh, or around Houston, near Houston, maybe what uh, 60 miles northeast of Houston, 50 miles northeast of Houston. Anyway, I've got this uh, letter from Baraka Church. It's not a letter; it's to anybody. You can get it off the internet. And it says, uh, Hurricane Rita Update, 10 October 2005. Thanks to God's magnificent grace, Bracket Church and RB Theme Junior Bible Ministries emerged unscathed from Hurricane Rita. Colonel Theme's home also was undamaged by the gusty winds that the hurricane brought to the Houston area. And the colonel spent a peaceful night during the storm. Thank you to everyone who prayed to keep the Houston area safe from the hurricane devastation. And I was there, and there was just uh, not much damage at all, except in the northeast part, and maybe a lot of trees were down, but that was about it. No real structural damage. The Beaumont, Texas telephone hookup did suffer significant damage, but is continuing to meet in an alternative location. Please continue to pray for our tapers east of Houston who have experienced damage from Hurricanes Rita and Katrina. And I can tell you before we start today how my day went. I woke up at 4 a.m. I don't like waking up at 4 a.m., but I woke up at 4 a.m. And then we drove about an hour to... George H. Bush Intercontinental Airport and got on an airplane, and then we flew to Cincinnati, Ohio, and we got to see the sunrise in the airplane. That's neat. That's pretty. And then we got off the plane in Cincinnati, and it was cold, and people were wearing jackets. It was like a whole different world. Houston was hot. Houston's always hot, but uh, you can wear shorts in Houston in December a lot of the times. But... Uh, it was cold in Cincinnati, then we got on the plane and uh, came down to Charlotte, uh, and then my parents picked us up in Charlotte and took us to Gaffney, and then I got in the car and she fell asleep and I went 85 miles an hour to Anderson. And here I am today, and I had to do a lot of study right before class, so it's been a very busy day. So turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter uh, 26, verse 1. Matthew chapter 26, verse 1. And here we see the plot against Jesus. They're starting to make a plot against our Lord Jesus Christ. 26, 1. When Jesus had finished saying all these things, all these things refers to the fact of the things that he said in the temple in 22 and 23, chapters 22 and 23, and of course the Olivet Discourse in 24 and 25, and remember what he did through all that time. He blasted religion. He insulted every one of those people who were there, really, because they were all religious. And he, uh, uh, the best talk, I talking to my uh, uh, grandpa-in-law, who is a taper, and he said, you know what, the best talk is straight talk. And I say, yeah, that's just right. The best talk is straight talk, and that's what Jesus Christ gave him. Straight talk all the way. And he really ripped into the religious crowd, especially in 22 and 23, uh, when he uh, turned over the money changers in the temple, told them they were all going to hell, and then in 24 and 25 did similar things 
uh, telling all the religious crowd they were going to hell. Mean? No. True? Yes. Did they need to hear it? Yes. Plain talk, it would it worked for some of them. But if he would have been all uh, flowers and lilies, nothing, um, none of those would have believed. But even a few of those religious people believed because of his harshness. And we said, and it's not harshness; it's a true love. It's the true love of Jesus Christ for everyone, for all humanity, so that they uh, might uh, come to believe in Him. So when Jesus had finished saying all these things, He told His disciples. Now He's Moving toward the disciples, he's going to teach them something. And he says this in 26.2. You know, and uh, they should know, they don't really know, but uh, Jesus has been telling them this time after time, repeat, repeatedly. He's been linear, linear action starting this son of a gun since <laughs> I don't know when. He's been telling them, uh, look, I have to go to the cross. I have to go to the cross. I'm going to die. I'm going to go to the cross. And they're going to uh, persecute me. And they're going, and it's going to be horrible. And you're going to see it. And I'm going to die. And it's going to be the most horrific death you've ever seen. And so then he said, he tells them, you know. And I can imagine him looking at Peter. You know, Peter. I can imagine, he doesn't say that, but you can see. You know that after two days the Passover is coming. And the Son of Man will be betrayed to be crucified. Son of Man being betrayed to be crucified is passive voice, meaning he's going to allow it, meaning he's going to follow the Father's will. Now we have uh, Jesus Christ as God in deity and Jesus Christ as humanity, and he's going to allow himself to go to the cross and experience the most horrific death ever. There's never been a death like it, never will be a death since, the most painful death ever, and nobody will experience a, most, a, a, a more painful death than what our Lord experienced while he was being judged for the sins of the world on the cross. So he says, you know that after two days the Passover is coming. And what was the Passover? Do you remember what the Passover Do you remember the Passover? You see, uh, back at, during Moses' time, and they were trying to get out of uh, Egypt. And the old Pharaoh said, you ain't getting out of here. And then the, uh, one day the Lord said, all right, what I want you to do is take the blood of the lamb and put it uh, for all the believers. They would put the blood of the lamb on their door. And then when the angel of death would come by, it would kill only the firstborn of the unbelievers. And that's exactly what happened. And that was the Passover because the angels passed over those who had believed, those families who had believed, and did not kill the firstborn. But for all the unbelievers and all the Egyptians, well, they were dropping dead like crazy. All their firstborn were, and there was great weeping and mourning and all of that. So that's what the Passover is. And the Passover has a connection here because Jesus Christ is our Passover. That's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. Jesus Christ is our Passover. We believe in Jesus Christ, therefore all judgment of our sins is passed over. Passed over because it's been poured out on Jesus Christ and judged. And so all of this, you can see, is pretty basic doctrine, that what is, and it's what he's teaching the disciples, but they're having an awful, awful hard time with this stuff. You know that after two days the Passover is coming and the Son of Man will be betrayed to be crucified. Now the Passover for the Jews, point one, it is observed from Tuesday sundown sun goes down. Remember, the Passover occurred at night time. The angels passed over at night while everyone was sleeping. And while the Pharaoh was sleeping, his uh, firstborn and his youngest died. And then he, uh, well, he was a weirdo, but it's observed from Tuesday sundown until Wednesday sundown. This is how they observed Passover during the time when our Lord was on the earth. And Tuesday night for us, if it was Tuesday, if it, instead of Sunday night, if it were Tuesday night, it would be just like Wednesday for the Jews. I saw a Jew today, by the way. He had his old hat on and everything at the Charlotte airport. Big hat, long beard, and all of that. 
a Jew. But it, it reminded me that uh, uh, Jesus Christ is faithful, that uh, the Jews will be here until the millennium, but I seriously doubt he was a believer, and that's the sad part of it. But uh, continuing, <clears throat> and uh, it's observed from Tuesday sundown until Wednesday sundown. And Tuesday night would actually be Wednesday for the Jews, uh, just like a Sunday night, would, we could say, would be a Monday. The the Passover is described in Exodus 12, 1 through 14, and it's also mentioned in Leviticus 23, verse 5. And of course, as I told you, its significance for us is given in 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Now, in 26, verse 2, we actually have, this verse is loaded with doctrine, basic doctrines. And actually, the mechanics of our salvation are given right here, because it says, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to be crucified. It doesn't say Son of God, it says Son of Man. That's the humanity of Christ. We've studied the hypostatic union. Deity cannot die. Deity did not go to the cross. Humanity went to the cross. Humanity died as a substitute for us. And deity did not die. Deity was uh, has always is, always will be. Deity cannot die. Deity is omniscient. Deity is omnipresent. Deity cannot be in one place at a cross. Deity is everywhere. You can't put deity on a cross. Deity is omnipresent. So it was his humanity that was on the cross, and it was his humanity that bore the sins of the world. And in his humanity, he used the very same unique spiritual life we have to overcome the judgment of all the sins of the world. We'll never be tested that much, but that is what the spiritual life was tested to, and it handled it. The spiritual life handled the judgment of all the sins of all the world. And not only that, the unique spiritual life, the protocol of our Lord Jesus Christ, not only did it handle that, but it also handled the turning, uh, well, God the Father turned his back on God the Son. And God the Father and God the Son had been together in eternity past forever and ever and had perfect love for each other. Perfect love for each other. And we think of love in terms of human relationships. But God the Father and God the Son had perfect love for each other. And for three hours, while Jesus Christ was bearing the sins of the world on the cross, the God the Father actually turned his back on God the Son, whom he loved. With a love that we cannot understand, we will never understand until we go to heaven. We'll never understand that love. And he turned his back. And the spiritual life, what we have, sustained Him. The filling of God the Holy Spirit sustained Him. The eight problem-solving devices, He did not need rebound or occupation with Christ. And He was sustained on the cross by the things that are taught in Scripture. And we've been given, as royal family, the very same thing. So there's no real problem in our lives now, is there? Not when you look at it from the standpoint of the fact that uh, Jesus Christ was betrayed, almost, not really, but in terms of how we would think of it, betrayed by God the Father. God the Father just turned his back because he couldn't have nothing to do with sin. And all the sins of the world were poured out on him and judged. And uh, then... Of course, that is the means of our salvation. So the mechanics are all right here in 26.2. And the Son of Man will be betrayed to be crucified. Passive voice meaning by his own volition, Jesus Christ is going to choose to go to the cross. Now in 26.3. Then the chief priests, the, that, that would be the Sadducees. Now, the Sadducees are different from the Pharisees. The Pharisees are the theologians. They're conservative theologians. They actually believe in the Torah. They believe everything the Old Testament has to say. They believe that, uh, 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 they believe that there was a big flood. They believe uh, that there was Noah. They believe that a big fish swallowed Jonah. They believe all of these things. They believe in the angels. They believe in resurrection. But they never could come to believe in Jesus Christ. 
and that's the Pharisees. And they are, or it's, no, excuse me, uh, well the Pharisees, yeah, the Pharisees, that is how they were. The Sadducees, however, were a political, they were more of a political group. And they didn't believe in the resurrection. And they didn't believe in the uh, Torah, not the whole thing. They believed in parts of it, and they believed in parts of the law. But they did not believe in uh, angels, for example. The Sadducees did not believe in angels. Then the chief priests, these would be the Sadducees. And the chief priests, by the way, by this time the Roman Empire had a good grip on Israel, and they would choose the chief priests, and therefore the chief priest would be uh, would have some uh, but even but even then the Sadducees hated the Romans. Now then we have scribes. Scribes is a reference to Pharisees, and I just told you about the Pharisees and how they were uh, very religious and they believed everything in the Mosaic Law except they could not come to believe in Christ. And the elders of the people, the elders of the people means rulers, and the rulers of the people at this time were the Herodians. And all three of them met together in the court. They all three met together in the court outside the palace. There's a reason for this. If you've ever seen uh, Braveheart, you know the reason. In a palace, walls have ears. You know, uh, in, in Braveheart, when uh, all kinds of secrets are revealed because of uh, uh, one of the girls in the palace sleeps with one of the uh, generals, and one of the generals uh, gives away a secret. And so she tells the secret to somebody else. The secret gets spread around until Braveheart hears about it. Hears about it. And so what, what happens is the palace has ears. And there are always people lurking, eavesdropping as they call it. And that is, uh, that's why they went out in the court. They didn't stay. They, didn't, they went outside of the palace because they didn't want anyone to hear about their plans. So they went into the court. And that's because of, of, and they went into the court outside the palace of the high priest who was named Caiaphas. There's a lot of things about Caiaphas I won't go over. But at that point, in 26.4, they plotted to arrest Jesus by subtly, by subtlety, sorry. They plotted to arrest Jesus by subtlety and deceit and kill him. Now the only way that we could get these three groups of people together Sadducees, Pharisees, and Herodians. I mean, that would be like getting Democrats, Republicans, and Ross Perot all together agreeing on one subject. <laughs> In, impossible. But they they all come to agree upon this because Jesus because of Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is perfect humanity, and Jesus Christ poses a threat to their authority as they see it. And they say, the Herodians say, I have authority. And the Sadducees say, I have my authority. And the Pharisees say, I have my authority in the Word of God. And here's Jesus Christ just coming out uh, outside the box, as it were. Not even concerned with any of these, uh, uh, not even concerned with joining one of these political parties. Wasn't concerned with politics. And so they plotted to arrest Jesus by subtlety and deceit and kill him. Some points that come from this is the fact that religion is subtle and deceitful. Religion is subtle and deceitful. Religion a lot of times has a, a, a big bright white smile on the outside. Come join my church. And big smile and glad hand you and pat you on the back and get you in the church and praise you, etc., and uh, there's nothing of doctrine taught, nothing of grace taught. It's all religion. And uh, that's the only way they get you. Uh, and then they, uh, with all those smiles and all those accolades, all of a sudden, 10% uh, of your money is flowing out of your wallet. And you don't even know why. You've been deceived by religion. The subtlety and the deceitfulness of religion. And you start doing goofy things like instead of wearing your hair down, putting it up in a bun on top of your head. 
deceived by religion. And there's all sorts of examples of how religion deceives people. Now in 26 verse 5, But they said, this is all, this is the Sadducees, Pharisees, Herodians, all the religious people. But they said, not during the Passover feast, so that there will not be a riot among the people. Another thing about religion. Religion's always concerned about people. They're concerned about approval lust. And they love the adulation of people, and the religious people love the adulation of mobs. And uh, I dare say that's the way most churches uh, go today because they've gone toward religion and away from grace. And because they've gone toward religion, uh, they see crowds. And they get in a numbers fight. And that's why we have the uh, saying, e evangelistically speaking. Yeah, I could say I witnessed to uh, two million people, evangelistically speaking, which would be about five. So you see, uh, and it becomes a point of exaggeration. What I'm saying is, it becomes a point of competition, a point of exaggeration, and uh, 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 pastor against pastor. My congregation grew this much. Your congregation shrunk. You're you're a twerp. I'm great. I'm better than you are, etc. And that's the way religion looks at it. They always want people's approval, but people are sheep, and sheep need. A shepherd. And if you're going to be a, a Bible teacher, you can't be you can't be led around by the sheep, and that's what's wrong with most churches today. The shepherds being led by the sheep, and sheep are stupid. Sheep are dumb. Sheep need to be botted on the head. Sheep uh, sheep need uh, sheep need care on the one hand, and on the other hand, when they start walking away, they need a good whack on the head so that they'll get back in the fold. But if the the pastor's acting wimpy and, and the sheep say, "Bah, let's go this way," and the pastor says, "Bah, okay," then you've got a bunch of idiots, a bunch of sheep going nowhere, and that's what religion is, and that's what's happened to our country. And I almost had a special message for today, but I've stuck with Matthew. I almost had a special message that I studied last night to give today, but I figured, ah, I'll just keep with Matthew. But, but one day we'll get back to that uh, spe special message because it's, it's quite interesting concerning the, de de the degeneracy of a country. I woke up at 4 o'clock, remember. Okay. So religion is concerned about many things, and most of it's superficial manner of dress. If you dress a certain way, well, you must be religious. You must be in touch with God. I always think about the Pope with that big white hat. Almost looks like Ku Klux Klan. I don't know. Big white hat. Always walks out. Like, what, what kind of power is that, anyway? It, it's hilarious to me. Sometimes I watch it and laugh at him. And and you wonder if these people grew up wanting to be uh, Pope. If they were ever just in their backyard, 9, 11 years old. You just, I'm sorry, it's just, it's just something that crossed through my mind. What makes somebody want to be a self-righteous Pope and do idiotic things like that? But people praise that. They praise this man and say, oh, such a warm feeling when he goes by and moves his hand in the image of a cross and wears such a robe. Or when a priest gets up and uh, wears something like around here and wears a white collar and molests young kids and then everybody praises him. Go figure. But this is not, uh, that's religion, see? It's mode of dress. Well, he, a fa and they call him father, father this, father that. And we just studied where the Bible said he called no one father. Call no one father, and that's what it means. And all these Catholics are running around, father so-and-so, father so-and-so, and father so-and-so has been molesting people his whole life, and it's just sickening. But it's all because of manner of dress or manner of speech. God bless you, hallelujah, praise the Lord etc. And they use this manner of speech, and because they use that manner of speech, everybody thinks they're spiritual. 
It's just religion. Nothing. It's superficial. Nothing religious about that. And it, everything that uh, religion does is superficial. And so then again comes the principle. A principle we must, we must all note and we must always note. And that is that anything the unbeliever can do is not the unique spiritual life. Anything the unbeliever can do is not the unique spiritual life. The unbeliever can do all kinds of crazy things, but it's not the spiritual life. The unbeliever can give up all kinds of bad habits, but that's not the spiritual life. Now, sometimes lifestyle change is uh, in order for somebody who's believed in Christ. For example, they're, they've been a prostitute and they've believed in Christ. If they need to, if they want to live the spiritual life, well, they're going to have to stop prostituting themselves. And when they do prostitute themselves, they're going to have to use rebound and uh, wean themselves from it, etc. And uh, eventually live the unique spiritual life. But... Uh, but if someone's a prostitute and suddenly says, I'm no longer a prostitute, praise God, it doesn't mean she's saved. Just because a prostitute no longer is a prostitute, it just means she was an unsaved prostitute. Now she's an unsaved, self-righteous person walking around saying, I'm no longer a prostitute. And I wish my friends wouldn't be so, uh, would, would uh, follow me, etc. But they're still unsaved. And salvation is very simple, faith alone in Christ alone. We all know that, but uh, we're uh, just taking a brief look at religion. Now we move on in 26, verse 6, to Jesus' anointing. Jesus, Jesus is going to be anointed. And actually what we're moving in here into in this part is uh, Jesus going through dying grace. All of us at some point are going to face death if the rapture doesn't occur first. But all of us, a lot of people want the rapture to occur first. I could care less. But uh, uh, when uh, people face death, well, they're either going to have dying gr grace and they're going to face it with a gr great uh, dignity and great doctrine in their soul and it's going to be the happiest time in their life or it's going to be the most miserable time in their life if they don't have doctrine, or if they've rejected doctrine or neglected doctrine. If they've neglected or rejected doctrine, then death for even the believer will be uh, bitter, very bitter. But death for the person who has lived the unique spiritual life, it's almost welcomed, like the Apostle Paul almost welcomed it, especially when the time came. And this is Jesus Christ, uh, entering into the phase of dying grace. And we know this because Jesus Christ knows that in a couple days he's going to be hanging on a cross. Jesus Christ knows uh, better than anyone else he's about to die the most painful death ever. Ever. Nails are going to go through his hands and his feet, not to mention all the beatings he gets before that. And that's not even the most painful part because you know what? Uh, while the nail gets shoved through his foot and through his hand, he doesn't even squeak, doesn't even make a peep, doesn't even yell out or cry out. It's not until all of our sins are imputed to him and judged that he begins to scream. And in the Greek, it's a linear action start, meaning he screamed over and over again for three hours straight. It was uh, the the pain cannot be described in human terms, in terms of bearing the sins of the world, while God the Father turned His back on His uniquely born Son. It is indescribable, indescribable. And what what makes it even more indescribable is the fact that He was able to handle it using our spiritual life. So do we have problems? Well, yeah, we all have testing that we must go through in life. But uh, when you have Bible doctrine, Jesus Christ shows us right here. You know, what would Jesus do? Jesus would use the unique spiritual life. And that just shows how pitiful and how meaningless and how 
superficial our problems in life are, doesn't it? When we see the power of the spiritual life being used by Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus' anointing begins in 26, verse 6. Now, while Jesus was in Bethany, at the house of Simon the leper, this was about Monday night. Now, while Jesus was in Bethany, at the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster flask of aromatic oil, and poured it on his head as he reclined at the table. Now we know that the woman doing this is Mary of Bethany, and we know this from John chapter 11, verse 12. Matthew, uh, Matthew wasn't really that interested in this. But uh, John took more detailed uh, notes of it, and uh, John said it was Mary of Bethany. Now, the flask of aromatic oil comes from a substance called nard, and I, could t I don't know what that is, but it's a very expensive, and it was very expensive in the ancient world. And then in 26.8, when the disciples saw this, now Matthew is looking from a distance, and he's not really into the politics of this, and he's not really into the gossip of this. Remember, he's educated and he is a tax collector and uh, he recognizes the, uh, the flask of aromatic oil as being expensive, but uh, it was nothing that he couldn't buy in the past while he was a tax collector. So he really didn't, it wasn't something that impressed him that much because uh, Matthew was of a higher education and higher wealth, by the way. And Matthew had been wealthy, and now he's following Christ. And to see wealth being spread around or lavishly used, he just didn't really make a big deal out of it. But the, the other disciples did, and this is what he noted. This is what uh, caught him off guard a bit. When the disciples saw this, they were angry and said, This is a dead loss. And the actual use of that from the Greek is quite funny. This is a dead loss. Because uh, she was preparing, preparing him for his death, burial, and resurrection. And so they're all looking at this and said, this was a dead loss. Now where did this criticism start? We don't see it in Matthew, but we see it in John chapter 12, verse 4. It started from Judas Iscariot, who is not a believer. He is an unbeliever, and it was started by him, because he was the, remember, uh, Judas Iscariot was the treasurer of the bunch, unbelieving treasurer. He followed Jesus around. He was a user. You know, people follow people around just because they're users. Judas Iscariot was a user. He used our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> So the criticism was started by Judas Iscariot, John 12, 4, because he was the treasurer and he wanted the money. And he was going to steal the money. Uh, so therefore he had an unjust criticism that was picked up by the other disciples. The other disciples heard Judas Iscariot uh, say a few things negative against this and they picked it up. A few negative words, you know, something about uh, waste, wasting money or something like that. Other people who are frugal, you're right. She just wasted all that on Jesus, and etc. But it shows that they're, uh, they've all got human viewpoint. And the unjust criticism was picked up by the other, other disciples, except for Matthew. And we notice this because Matthew talks about it. And John, and because, and because John talks about it. So all the other disciples uh, be, became very critical. And then in 26.9, this is what uh, Judas Iscariot had to say about this. For this could have been sold for a high price, and the money given to the poor. Well, he wasn't really looking that the money go to the poor, but since it was already wasted, he thought he would sound like he was very interested in the social gospel. And uh, he was. And it is clear that Judas Iscariot was interested in the social 
gospel. What's the social gospel? The social gospel is what Catholics do. They rarely give the true gospel. Sometimes it gets through, sometimes it doesn't. But they go to places like Africa and they clothe them and they give them uh, food and they give them shoes and they give them Bibles, and uh, then they uh, take the pages out of the Bible and wrap weed in it and smoke it. And uh, that, yes, one time a missionary group went to Africa, and all of a sudden, all these Africans started demanding Bibles. And th these people were, well, hallelujah, praise the Lord, they're having a great revival. And then once they investigated it, they found out that uh, the, the natives... Uh, could take the Bible and rip the pages out and it worked perfectly to smoke their weed. <laughs> and that is uh, so. Uh, but in it, what, where was I? So we're talking about Judas here and he's interested in the social gospel. And he says, uh, well, you could have... Uh, you could have gave all this to the poor and you could have fed maybe 10, 20 different uh, poor families uh, by doing that. So he com he functioned completely on human viewpoint, and that's because he was, uh, first of all, an unbeliever. Believers can function under human viewpoint as well, but Judas was most definitely an unbeliever, and we'll get to uh, some very exact passages that make it unmistakably clear that he was an un unbeliever. And also, uh, one thing we can say about Judas is in, in this crowd, he, he may be the only liberal in the crowd. The only bleeding heart worried about poor people. The Hillary Clinton of the bunch. Forgive me. But uh, that is uh, what he was. And uh, 2610, our Lord's going to set it all straight. 2610, when Jesus learned of this, he said to them, Why are you causing this woman trouble. She has done a beautiful service for me. He focuses it all back on the fact that he's the Son of God and she is doing a service for him. And why are you being critical, in other words? So he turns it around and just starts praising this woman. And by the way, the women in Jesus' day were far more mature spiritually than any of the men. All the women, uh, Peter, Peter, and all they they get they became mature after his death. But the women, uh, they were growing in grace. Look at this. I mean, they're already uh, she's already getting him re ready for the burial and the resurrection. She knows it's going to happen. And Peter's uh, going around thinking, Nah, the Lord's not going to go to the cross. And she's thinking, Well, yes, he is going to the cross, and because of it, I'm going to do this thing. To uh, kind of a ritual type thing to show that uh, I, I'm appreciative that he's going to the cross, so I'm going to anoint him for his death. She knew doctrine. This woman knew doctrine. This woman knew more doctrine than Peter, James, John, all of them put together. And they criticized her for it. And when you get to know a lot of doctrine, you're going to be criticized, and don't be shocked when it happens. But when you have a lot of doctrine, you don't give a damn. You know, oh well. You just know it. And you keep on moving and keep on plugging. And then in 26 verse 11, a principle that uh, the Democratic Party and our, country, and our country should note very well. For you will always have the poor with you. But you will always, but you will not always have me. So he brought the focus back around to the fact that he's the Son of God, and he had to do this because Judas Iscariot was an unbeliever. All the others knew he was the Son of God, but they just went along with the unbeliever in his human viewpoint for a little while uh, because they were believers out of fellowship. And so what happened here is uh, he, he just goes ahead and he gives them the straight facts. He says, uh, uh, you're worried about the poor? The poor are always going to be here. In other words, I'm about to go to the cross. He's bringing it down to the significance of the cross, and he's saying the cross is very significant, Significant. I'm about to go to the cross, and the poor are always going to be here. And they are today. 
And any war on poverty will let me say that charity is fine and wonderful. But any socialistic war on poverty, any type of uh, social welfare state, any type of thing like that is trying to make Jesus out to be a liar. President Johnson tried to make Jesus out to be a liar by having a war on poverty and saying we could eradicate poverty. 26, right here, uh, 26, uh, 11, for you will always have the poor with you. You cannot eradicate poverty. There will always be poor people. And sometimes poor people will move into the middle class, and sometimes poor people will get rich, and sometimes rich people will get poor in free societies. And then we have all of these, uh, the, the communism, socialism, all of these things are satanic because it tries to eradicate poverty. And you're going to learn about it in college when you go, and there's going to be a lot of liberal, liberal professors who are going to say, uh, we could annihilate poverty. Look how much money the United States has. If we wouldn't fight a war on terror, and if we would just uh, give that money to the poor, there would be no more poor people. And it's a lie. A satanic lie. And we know that because Jesus simply says, here, you're always going to have the poor with you. Does that mean you can't help them? No. You do have a charity toward the poor. And if, uh, if someone's in need and you want to help them out, well, you help them out. And it's up to you. Free will, see. But it's not a government forcing you to pay 90% of your income to help them, as they do in socialistic countries. So 2612. When she poured this oil on my body... She did it to prepare me for burial. See, our Lord knew why she was doing it. He knew that she knew doctrine, and he has to teach them doctrine, but he teaches it. The woman keeps silent. Notice this. The woman doesn't say anything through all of this. She, she, she doesn't stand up and get all offended and say, I bought this for the Lord, and I was going to put this on the Lord, and because I know he's about to die, and make a big deal out of it. No. Women who grow up into maturity, uh, they learn how to handle themselves in the way that they should, in a way in which that uh, she knows that the Lord, she knows that she's right with the Lord. What does she care what other people think? And women who have grown in grace don't care what other women think or what other men think, especially what other men think. But uh, when they grow in grace, they don't even care what other women think. And they just uh, keep on moving. And so she didn't say a word, and she let the Lord speak for her. And the Lord did speak for her. When she poured this oil on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. He's chewing them out, whether they know it or not. He's chewing out Peter. He's chewing out Judas Iscariot. All of those who have uh, been so critical at this point. Then in 26.13, I tell you the truth. Wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Well, of course. Guess what? She's written in the Bible. We all we, we just heard about her. We heard about the gospel of Christ. And who else did we hear about? Mary of Bethany. This is a woman who is marked by Jesus Christ as being mature. And he gives her an accolade that uh, Peter didn't even get. Peter thought he was all great and wonderful when he said, uh, uh, surely after Peter already, when Peter acknowledged that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, Peter thought that he had done something great. Well, he just uh, uh, gave a, uh, an, an, an accolade to this woman that is so phenomenal that uh, no accolade like this was ever given to a man during the time that Jesus Christ was on the earth. More praise went to this woman than actually anyone. He praised the centurion by saying, I haven't seen such faith. But listen to this. I tell you the truth. Wherever the gospel, this gospel, is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. 
Her impact was because she grew in grace and in knowledge, and she followed the Lord, and she did it quietly. And she's pretty much invisible. Who are all the visible people through Matthew? Well, we got Peter, we got Judas, uh, we got others, etc. And here comes some obscure woman, a woman that Matthew doesn't even name. Matthew won't even name her. John does, Matthew doesn't. And uh, and this woman is being uh, pointed out by Jesus Christ as being a mature lady, as being one who has grown in grace and in knowledge. So in fact, uh, one of the most, it's not really peculiar, because Jesus Christ was a genius, of course, and perfect, but uh, one of the most fascinating things is the fact that during Christ's ministry, more women got women got to maturity faster than the men. I guess because they responded so well to the Lord. I mean, he was a perfect teacher and uh, perfectly gracious, a perfect teacher, and he was harsh too. But for some reason, it was the women during that time that really, really uh, went to maturity and actually made a, a huge difference. And at the cross, and guess what? All the, everybody else scattered in fear. And the only people at the cross, well, we'll have John there, but we have the women watching our Lord being crucified and their compassion overflowing and their tears. And all of that uh, comes out in the inner beauty of a woman when she has doctrine. And this woman has an inner beauty. She wasn't looking for anything sexual here. I wouldn't even want to have anyone think that at all. She was simply showing respect. And remember, respect is the highest form of love from a lady. And she was showing respect toward Jesus Christ, her Savior, and also showing that she knew doctrine by pouring this on him in preparation for his burial. And Peter didn't even accept that yet. We're going to see Peter in a moment trying to chop off somebody's ear. And Peter's an idiot compared to this woman. Complete idiot. And yet, uh, she, she's, silent. she's a silent hero. This, this lady in this passage is a silent hero. And just as we are silent heroes today, if we grow in grace and in knowledge... And uh, we're invisible heroes. Uh, Jesus Christ made sure that she would be visible by pointing her out in the Word of God. And uh, her name has been in the Word of God uh, ever since. What Year 2005, and we still hear about uh, Mary of Bethany. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to study this portion of the Word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning the things that we have noted so that we can grow in grace and in knowledge. In, in Christ's name we ask it. Amen.